In this lecture, we will talk about fermentation and the concept of immunization. Fermentation is the chemical transformation of organic substances into simpler compounds by the action of enzymes, complex organic catalysts which are produced by microorganisms such as molds, yeasts or bacteria. Enzymes act by hydrolysis, a process of breaking down or pre-digesting complex organic molecules to smaller compounds and nutrients. The word fermentation is derived from the Latin meaning to boil, since the bubbling and foaming of early fermenting beverages seemed slowly akin to boiling. Human beings are known to have made fermented foods since Neolithic times. The earliest types were beer, wine and bread and cheeses made by bacteria and molds. These were soon followed by East Asian fermented foods, yogurt and other fermented milk products, pickles, vinegar, butter and a host of traditional alcoholic beverages. For Early societies, the transformation of basic food materials into fermented foods was a mystery and a miracle, for they had no idea what caused the usually sudden, dramatic and welcomed transformation. Some societies attributed this to divine intervention. In the late 1700s, Lavoisier showed that in the process of transforming sugar to alcohol and carbon dioxide, as in the case of wine, the weight of the former that was consumed in the process equaled the weight of the latter produced. In 1810, Guy Lussac summarized the process with the famous equation C6H12O6 yielding C2H5OH plus carbon dioxide. The entire process was considered to be a simple chemical reaction and yeast was thought to play a physical rather than a chemical role. The first solid evidence of living nature of yeast appeared between 1837 and 1838 when three publications appeared by Cagniard de la Torre, T. Swan and Q. Zing, each of whom independently concluded as a result of microscopic investigations that yeast was a living organism that reproduced by budding. The word yeast, it should be noted, traces its origins back to the Sanskrit word meaning boiling. The view that fermentation was a process initiated by living organisms soon aroused fierce criticism from the finest chemists of the day, especially Justice von Liebig, Berzelius and Frederick Wohler. A long battle, battle ensued and while it was gradually recognized that yeast was a living organism, its exact function in fermentations remained a matter of controversy. The chemists still maintained that fermentation was due to catalytic action or molecular vibrations. The debate was finally brought to an end by the great French chemist Louis Pasteur who during 1850s and 60s in a series of classic investigations proved conclusively that fermentation was initiated by living organisms. The chemists of that period believed that conversion of sugar to alcohol and carbon dioxide was a simple chemical process. Ironically, it was Pasteur, a chemist, who convinced the world that all fermentations are a result of microbial activity. In those days, winemaking was an important industry in France. The distillers were worried because the quality of their wine was deteriorating. In the summer of 1856, M. Bigot, father of one of Pasteur's students in chemistry, called upon Pasteur to help him overcome difficulties he was having manufacturing alcohol by fermentation. Pasteur investigated the fermentation process and found that their problems were due to conversion of sugar to lactic acid by rod-shaped bacteria. <coughs> H. 
His microscopic observations made him realize that when alcohol was produced normally, the yeast cells were plump and budding. But when lactic acid would form instead of alcohol, small rod-like microbes were always mixed with the yeast cells. He found that yeast's characteristic of alcoholic fermentation had been replaced by bacteria which brought about lactic fermentation which made wines sour. Pasteur then developed a process of heating the grape juice just enough to kill most contaminating bacteria without changing the juice's basic qualities so that it could be then inoculated with yeast to ensure that alcohol fermentation occurred. Today, pasteurization, as this process is called, is routinely used in fermentations and dairy industries. During his studies on butyric fermentations, Pasteur discovered another fundamental biological phenomena, the anaerobic form of life. He microscopically observed the fluids that were undergoing butyric fermentations. He observed that bacteria at the margin of the drop of fluid in contact with air became immotile, whereas those in the center of the drop remained motile. The suggestion that air might have an inhibitory effect on microorganisms was confirmed by Pasteur, who showed that when air was passed through the fermenting fluids, it not only retarded but completely stopped the fermentation. He introduced the terms aerobic to designate life in the presence of oxygen and anaerobic to designate life in the absence of oxygen. This process of inhibition of the fermentation process by oxygen came to be known as the pasture effect. <coughs> Interestingly, until his death in 1873, the eminent German chemist von Liebig continued to attack Pasteur's work on fermentation, putrefaction and infectious diseases. He recognized the similarity of these phenomena but refused to believe that living organisms were the main causative agents. Fermentation, he felt, was primarily a chemical rather than a biological process. History has shown with the discovery of enzymes that Pasteur was not entirely right nor Leibig entirely wrong. Many scientists, including Pasteur, had attempted unsuccessfully to extract the fermentation enzyme from yeast. Success came finally in 1897 when the German scientist Edward Buchner ground up yeast, extracted a juice from them, then found to his amazement that this dead liquid would ferment a sugar solution forming carbon dioxide and alcohol, just like living cells. Clearly, the so-called unorganized ferments behaved just the organized ones. And it was finally understood that fermentation is caused by enzymes which are produced by microorganisms. In 1907, Buchner won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his work, which opened a new era in enzyme and fermentation studies. Advances in microbiology and fermentation technology have continued steadily up until the present. Let us now move on to the concept of immunization. History of vaccines and immunization begins with the story of Edward Jenner, a country doctor living in Berkeley, England, who in 1796 performed the world's first vaccination. Edward Jenner was born in Berkeley, Gloucestershire on 17th May 1949. He was a country physician who was also very interested in various natural sciences studying bird behavior, human blood, hydrogen and hot air balloons and geology. His broad interest in the sciences led him to carry out the first scientific studies of immunity to smallpox. Smallpox was a dreaded disease in Europe as it was highly contagious and the mortality rates were as high as 25 to 40 percent and those who survived had scars due to the blister like pustules. However, those who survived also obtained lifelong immunity to the disease. Variolation, the method for the prevention of smallpox by deliberate introduction of material from smallpox pustules into the skin, was quite common then. 
This generally produced a less severe infection than naturally acquired smallpox but still induced immunity to it. Though like any other doctor of the time, Edward Jenner carried out variolation to protect his patients from smallpox, he was in search for a more predictable and safer method of protection against the disease. From the early days of his career, Edward Jenner had been intrigued by the country lore which said that people who caught cowpox from their cows could not catch smallpox. Jenner had heard a dairy maid say, I shall never have a smallpox for I have had cowpox. I shall never have an ugly pockmarked face. In fact, it was a common belief that dairy maids were in some way protected from smallpox. This and his own experience of variolation as a boy and the risks that accompanied it led him to undertake the most important research of his life. Cowpox is a mild viral infection of cows. It causes a few pox on their udders but little discomfort. Milkmaids occasionally caught cowpox from the cows. In May 1796, a dairy maid, Sarah Nelms, consulted Jenner about a rash on her hand. This figure shows Sarah Nelms' hand with rashes. Jenner diagnosed cowpox rather than smallpox as you can see in the handwritten comment made by Jenner. Sarah confirmed that one of her cows, a cow called Blossom, had recently had cowpox. Edward Jenner realized that this was his opportunity to test the protective properties of cowpox by giving it to someone who had not yet suffered from smallpox. He chose James Phipps, the 8-year-old son of his gardener. On 14th May 1796, he made a few scratches on one of James' arms and rubbed into them some material from one of the pox on Sarah's hand. A few days later, James became mildly ill with cowpox but was well again a week later. This proved to Jenner that cowpox could pass from, pass from person to person as well as from cow to person. The next step was to test whether the cowpox would now protect James from smallpox. On 1st July, Jenner injected the boy with the material from smallpox lesions. As Jenner anticipated and undoubtedly to his greatest relief, James did not develop smallpox either on this occasion or on the many subsequent events when his immunity was tested again. It is important to stress here that the nature of these diseases and their viruses would not be known for over 100 years. Jenner was much ahead of his time. Jenner followed up this experiment with many others. In 1797, Jenner sent a short communication to the Royal Society describing his experiment and observations. However, the paper was rejected. Jenner's newly proven technique for protecting people from smallpox was not received well with the medical fraternity. However, what he had discovered could not be denied and eventually his discovery had to be accepted. A discovery that was to change the world. So successful was Jenner's discovery that in 1840, the government of the day banned any other treatment for smallpox other than that of Jenner's. Edward Jenner spent much of the rest of his life supplying cowpox material to others around the world and discussing related scientific matters. He was so involved in corresponding about smallpox that he called himself the vaccine clerk to the world. <clears throat> in 1967, the World Health Organization launched its campaign to eradicate smallpox worldwide. They estimated at that time that there were still up to 15 million cases of smallpox each year. The biggest problem areas were South America, Africa and the Indian subcontinent. Their approach was to vaccinate every person in the areas at risk. Teams of vaccinators from all over the world 
journeyed to the remotest of communities. After a period of watching for new cases, in, 18, in 1980, the WHO formally declared smallpox is dead. This is the WHO certification of smallpox eradication in 1980. The most feared disease of all time had been eradicated, fulfilling a prediction that Edward Jenner had made in 1801. It has been estimated that the task he started has led to saving of more human lives than the work of any other person. The last remaining specimens of the smallpox virus are now held in just two laboratories in Siberia and the USA. The samples used for research are afforded higher security than a nuclear bomb. One day, they too will be destroyed. Smallpox has become the first major infectious disease to be wiped out from the face of the earth. Louis Pasteur's first important discovery in the study of vaccination came in 1879 and was regarding the disease known as chicken cholera. Around 1880, he isolated the bacteria responsible for chicken cholera and grew it as a pure culture. Pasteur arranged for a public demonstration of an experiment which was successful in many trials. He inoculated healthy chickens with his pure cultures. Students, what would you expect next to happen? Right, even Pasteur anticipated and expected the chickens to die. But to his surprise, his chickens remained hale and hearty. Pasteur realized that he had accidentally used cultures which were several weeks old instead of fresh cultures. Some weeks later, he repeated the same experiment, this time using two different groups of chicks. One of the groups had been injected at the first demonstration with the old culture, whereas the other group had not been exposed to any culture previously. Both groups were now injected with fresh cultures. This time, the chicks of the second group became sick and died, whereas those of the first group remained hale and hearty. Pasteur was puzzled at the results, but he soon found out the reason. In some way, the old cultures lost their ability to cause disease. But these attenuated bacteria still retained their capacity to produce antibodies in the host. Pasteur realized that in a sense he was repeating the studies of Jenner who had conferred immunity to smallpox by vaccinating individuals with a mild form of cowpox. He called the attenuated cultures as vaccines and developed the concept of vaccination acknowledging Jenner's work because in Latin vacca means cow and we have studied about Jenner's work on cowpox and smallpox. <coughs> by now Pasteur had become very famous. It was a common belief that he could work wonders with bacteria and control any infection. He had an inch skill in handling microorganisms and reaching to correct conclusions. Although the method of vaccination had been previously developed by English physician Edward Jenner in 1796, the difference between the smallpox vaccination of Jenner and Pasteur's Chicken cholera vaccination was that the weakened form of the latter disease organisms had been generated artificially. Thus, it was not required to find a natural weak form of the disease organism. It was this discovery that revolutionized work in the prevention of infectious diseases and has helped save countless lives since then. The final and certainly most Famous success of Pasteur's research was the development of a vaccine against rabies or hydrophobia. This was the first human disease he was working on and was a challenge for him considering that he was not a physician by profession. After a lot of hard work, Pasteur had succeeded in producing a vaccine against rabies. Using a concoction of dried spinal cord material harvested from rabbit, rabbits, he had saved the lives of 40 
rabies infected dogs but was yet to test it on humans pasteur was not very sure if he was ready for human trials particularly because he was not successful in isolating the rabic substance but on july 6 1885 nine year old joseph mister and his mother appeared at pasteur's laboratory two days earlier the young boy had been bitten repeatedly by a rabbit dog his mother knew that her son would die and hence she appealed to pasteur to treat her son because she wanted to take that one in a million chance which could save her son's life pasteur administered the vaccine and was surprised and relieved when joseph survived and recovered from rabies rabies was the last major research of the master scientist his health was failing and paralysis of his left side from a serious stroke he suffered in his 46th year made his working in the laboratory increasingly difficult pasteur died on september 28 1895 after suffering additional strokes thus the journey which started with edward jenner and continued with pasteur is still continuing with various new vaccines being discovered every day particularly even the most recent coronavirus vaccine